You got it. Hi, uh, I'm Barton Chittenden. Uh, I do uh, tech support for hardware solutions. Oh. Ah. Maximize all of my screens, but now I'm closing them on the Okay. I'd like to talk about uh, Koha from the perspective of some of the guys, some of the guys tech support, and show how that fits in with the design of, of Koha. Uh, one of the things about tech support is that it's two handshakes, two handshakes away from people. So, um, uh, and, and the other thing about it is that nobody calls up tech support and says, uh, my system's working perfectly. So I have, the, between the two of those things, I have a, a sort of a different perspective of, of, of Koha. Um, I don't know if anybody, any of you have uh, read The Princess Bride. Um, there's, there's a note at the beginning that The Princess Bride is the, the, the part of the movie is the good part of the movie. And right at the end, is everything in the story that was left out of the good part of the story because it wasn't very nice. Um, and uh, in that, um, Inigo Montoya uh, succumbs to his wounds. Um, uh, Miracle Max and Potion wears off and, and, and uh, Wesley dies. And uh, the white horses get away. And the race goes. So that's kind of um, that's kind of what tech support is like a little bit. I, I don't see the good parts of the whole um, And so I, I more than anything, I just want to warn you that that um, my perspective is a little strange. It, you know, it just it just isn't the, the, what you're going to see tonight. That doesn't mean that Coha is bad. It just means that I see that. Okay. Um, just for for a point of reference for tech support. Um, uh, how, how many of you have uh, uh, recently, have, say in the six, last six months, had a tech support phone call for anything? Okay. Um, did your experience include uh, pressing buttons in a phone system? <laughs> okay, keep your hands up uh, if you have a long wait on hold. Uh, what about hearing, I'm sorry, we're having, you're having trouble with your cable modem, router, or phone service. Does that sound familiar? All right, uh, I'm gonna give your arms a break. Put your hands down here. You were happy with your text phone support phone call. You really felt like the other hand, the person on the other end of the line was listening. Or you really felt like they were sorry. Okay, you can put your hands down. The underlying problem here is that when you call into an enormous phone company center, you're going to get somebody who's taking 150 calls a day and 
who has been turned into a robot. And they're dealing with the same problems over and over and over again. And that's not a good idea. Okay. <laughs> One of the reasons for this is that computers can solve problems, can cause problems faster than people can solve. So uh, in a previous life, I did support for a, uh, a voice over IP uh, package, a lot like ARM. And we had a feature that we, uh, was rushed into production. It didn't get ad adequately tested at scale. And it a ended up crashing the entire phone net network every 20 seconds. <laughs> it took operations three days to figure this out. <coughs> And the whole time I was left saying, I'm sorry, you're having trouble with your voice. Yes, we're aware of this issue. No, I don't have a resolution at this time. Those were the three longest days of my life in tech support. And it sucked my compassion dry. So if uh, talking, uh, taking down an entire telecom voice system every 20 seconds is on the extreme left here, then co-op probably lives about two thirds of the way to the right. Um, uh, because Co has a mature open source project with an excellent QA team. Shout out to every, all the QA people. Um, <laughs> and because it's deployed on a lot of small servers rather than one large server. It's unlikely that we will get hit with a catastrophic outage that takes everything out of line, especially one that takes everything out of line for 20 seconds, every 20 seconds. But, you know, one or more bad bugs in a major release can create sort of a slow motion version of this meltdown. And support staff gets overwhelmed not in a single day, but just worn down over a period of time. Tech support is a human endeavor. And it only works when the people doing it have the time, energy, and patience to pay attention. The effects on our compassion, our ability to listen and communicate effectively can be diminished. So this talk is aimed at looking at some of the design decisions that would make COCA a little easier to support, either for a systems library or site which has their own COCA instance or for a support net vendor. In essence, our, able, our, our goal is to be able to support co-op with kindness, compassion, and to be entirely present for those who work. So what do we do? Uh, the, the first thing is communication. Um, at Bywater, we use the term reference interview, uh, similar to the way we uh, used it you know, on a reference desk. Uh, we focus on broad, non-leading questions and try to determine what the partner wants and expects and how that differs from their experience. What they, what they were expecting, what they got. Uh, Nick used the example uh, uh, a couple of days ago of a library patron talk, talking to a reference librarian asking about clouds and they really wanted to know about AppStarter. We have the same sorts of issues in Texas. So somebody wants something, but what they say and what they want is a different thing. And the primary, one of the primary aspects of technical support is to find out what the difference is between what they say they want and what they really want. Um, the, second issue, the second thing that we do in tech support is we try and classify issues. We want to assess the urgency and importance of issues. We want to categorize issues so that we can we can uh, bring uh, similar uh, similar issues together. Maybe it's something you know. Maybe we can find out that something's already been solved. But we want to find out if it's a bug or a feature. Sometimes things are bugs. Sometimes it's just it's it's not a bug. It's, Something that just needs to be explained. Uh, we want to find out what the right questions are to ask because we can't always figure out what the you know, 
what the solution is or what the exact problem is from the initial interview. But maybe we can get examples. Maybe we can, you know, and that's going to vary from, from type of problem to type of problem. You're going to ask about an acquisitions problem in a different way than you would ask about a solution. <clears throat> and the, the final thing is that we want to we want to get you know if we have an issue that we can't solve right off the bat we want to get that issue to the right person the person who has the answer. The next part is replicating issues. If we if we can see the problem and make it happen ourselves, we know that we've done the communication right. We're we're talking apples to apples. This also makes a troubleshooting easier. And finally, we have troubleshooting. We want to get that down to the root cause of the issue and either find a solution or try and find a workaround. If, if, or if it's a bug that we can't just solve right outright, maybe we can figure out a way around it. So let's look at some of the challenges that make each of those things a little difficult. Um, communication. Sometimes the interfaces are confusing. Um, so we get a lot of bugs about lost statuses and how those how those work. Um, when you look at lost statuses, it could be <coughs> system preferences. It could be the way the authorized values are set up. It could be argument to the cron job. And it could be something about the lost statuses of the items themselves. And it could even uh, be where those, where those get set in the system. Um, but the, the rules about these are never explicitly stated in clear. It's all, it's, you know, you've got a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here. And so the, uh, by having that spread out all over everywhere, it makes it difficult to see all in one place what's what's causing what now and that that causes that causes support. Um, another another thing is sometimes we get <coughs> interfaces that are difficult to describe. So um, in acquisitions, a lot of the pages um, on the acquisition pages are, are are very similar to one another. If you get a screenshot, you don't know which page it came from. Um, and that's, it, it, sometimes it's difficult to tell how a partner got to a certain screen. And those are all things that we need, we need to find out what happened, you know, step one, step two, step three, step four. And that can get a little dicey. <clears throat> um, Sometimes we have inconsistent interfaces. So um, in COHA circulation notices, we have advanced notices and we have overview notices. And the overview notices have one syntax for trying to show the item data on the notice. And the overview notices, uh, or the advanced notices, uh, have a different syntax. And we get a lot of we get a lot of uh, problems, a lot of reports of people getting confused between these. Things. If those were consistent, if the if the interfaces were the same for both of those, we would avoid a lot of problems. Um, so now uh, talking about classifying issues, um, a lot of times. Uh, we don't know from the initial descriptions of problems that we have the same problem. Uh, you know, it's, it, it may be buried a couple of layers. Um, a lot of times, uh, I, one of the things that I try to do is get people to copy in the breadcrumbs from the page. And the red, breadcrumbs and maybe the link to the breadcrumbs need to be, uh, need to have this exactly the same text in there. This has gotten better over time, but, um, uh, and most of these things that I'm talking about have as well. Um, so uh, 
Then um, there's also this also gets reflected into Bugzilla. Um, we do we do a lot of categorization in Bugzilla, but Bugzilla doesn't necessarily follow this way. Um, Another thing is that it's, uh, this gets back to something I said earlier. It's hard to figure out when a problem is a bug or a misunderstanding. Um, and finally, uh, good error messages make categorization easier. Um, these are hidden in Plaque. Uh, when a software error happens under Plaque, all you see is a small message on the screen that says internal server error. Um, now, uh, I don't know if you can read this very well, this is the one screen that I, is, is kind of small. Uh, this is the way that the, uh, the error messages look um, before we had flat, before we started using flat. And it looks really ugly, and you know, when, the, when somebody sees that flash up on their screen, it's not very pretty. Um, the internal server message probably isn't any prettier, but this one has information on it that we need. Um, it has the error message, the Perl error message. And it also has um, the, uh, it has an email address that this can get sent to. And we don't, we don't get those email, uh, we don't get those emails anymore. Um, and that's, that's an issue. <clears throat> so, um, let's talk about replicating issues. Um, it's not always obvious where uh, the configuration is that, that allows you to trigger something. If you're trying to replicate something, there may be a system preference that's set that you don't even know about. And that can be, that can be, you know, so either I don't know about it when I'm trying to replicate the problem on a partner system, on my own system, or if I'm trying to, even worse, is when I, I have my system set up the way they do, I write up a series of, of steps to replicate the problem in a bug, and nobody can replicate it because I didn't know about some system errors. Another uh, issue that we have is that I don't always have the initial state of a problem. So um, with holds issues, a lot of times the hold, the, the problem with the hold shows up when somebody either uh, goes to check in a book and trigger the hold, capture the hold, or uh, it might happen with the, when the whole key won't fill it, it keeps running. But the problems leading up to it are in the data before either one of those things happen. So not having that, not having that, not knowing what that state is, takes things for the um, Sometimes we have intermittent issues, things that don't happen all the time. You got to run off every, every Developer in here, when you say uh, I can see the internal from. Um, so uh, that's actually a special case of, of the not having an initial state, not having enough data to, to, to be able to replicate. Um, the, the final thing is that a lot of times it's hard to figure out what the smallest amount of data is that would, would cause a problem. Um, when you're trying to when you're trying to replicate and when you're trying to troubleshoot, you want to find the simplest version of a problem that you can. And uh, sometimes data sort of gets woven into itself in interrelated in ways that, that are not obvious. So the final thing that we do is troubleshooting. Uh, some parts of, of Koha, the database, um, the old key builder, and uh, maybe search.pm, 
are something that uh, Kyle calls scary basements. Uh, these are places where the internals of the code are not well documented, sometimes not even very well understood. Um, sometimes we get uh, code that's written by people who have left the community. Sometimes code builds in complexity over time, and uh, nobody really knows what the function is. Um, I mentioned intermittent problems. Sometimes we run into intermittent problems. They don't have, we don't have enough sample data to be able to spot it. And in those cases, a lot of times we just sort of have to throw up our hands and say, it's a glitch and move on. Now that doesn't mean it's going to be a glitch forever, but um, sometimes we just we find things that we can't, we don't know. <clears throat> Um, we have data issues sometimes, um, then, and this is something that um, we get something that, that violates some assumptions that the code makes, uh, you know, data integrity issues. And this is increasingly common as we are moving into using objects. Um, places where uh, the previous code would have just done a query and, and uh, we might not have gotten all the data because of the data. Now we don't get the data, and then it actually causes a spread of trigger that pop or something. And, it just, it um, and that's not, that's a bad thing, but it's not a bad thing. Um, uncovering those, uncovering the, the, the data itself, or uncovering the assumptions that are made <coughs> is actually in the long run going to make Hoha more reliable. But you know, it's no fun to try and check something when you're guessing over here. Um, there's a final thing that, that uh, causes me some problems. Um, I, I, uh, I was a pro programmer before I came to Bywater. I still do a little bit of it here and there. But tech support is very fast paced. Um, I'm, you know, somebody, somebody's always got a problem. I, I, the team fills up very quickly. I need to jump on things, take care of it. Sometimes I get into a situation where I have to go in and read, read the, uh, the source code. And it's one thing for a developer to spend three hours reading source code on something that they are not familiar with. And it's another thing for me to be reading our source code for three hours because things are backing up behind me while I do that. Um, so um, any places where, where we have the, the ability to make that a little bit easier, not have to dig into the source code, that's always a good thing for us. So what do we make, how do we make this easier? Um, well, on the communication side, uh, the user interface should be explicit about the effects, about what it does. Uh, features should be clearly and strictly documented so that it's clear not only what the software does, but what it doesn't do. Because a lot of times we get into situations where I'm like, well, is this or isn't this a problem? And if I have, if I know, if I have it, something clearly documented that says, Okay, the, the software will do this or it will do this. If it does anything else, then I know. Like configurations should be grouped together. Um, and that affects uh, uh, what Einstein used to call spooky action at a distance. So something that gets changed in a system preference over somewhere that you don't know about. That's bad. Uh, so, I, there's been a movement to move, for instance, more of a circulation system preference, system preferences into the circuit final. And that, those are the kinds of things that are very much, those, those kinds of things can make COHA easier to support. Um, we need to use a controlled vocabulary. Um, 
if we have a, a vocabulary that's consistent from the database level, the tables and, and uh, tables and fields um, to the, the the names of the, the controller files, the, the Perl files, all the way out to what you see in the user interface. Those should all line up. Now, one of the things I was thinking about, um, Chris's talk brought up the idea, of, you know, he mentioned that, that, that translatability is really important for Perl. And that's going to violate this, this principle here. So I'm not, I'm not stuck on that, but there is a need for consistency. Some layer of consistency. Um, uh, I talked a little bit earlier about consistency uh, in, in the uh, the notices and slips. There are other places where where things are, are not handled. Um, so any place that we can build consistency into the system means that somebody can learn one thing over here and have it hold in four other places in the co-op. And that, that makes Koha easier to learn and makes it easier to support. So let's talk about classification. Um, wherever possible, classification of bugs and errors should follow what the user sees. Um, I'm going to do a quick digression. Um, in high school, I had a European history teacher, um, and we were talking about the succession of kings and um, the importance of having male heirs and so forth. And, so on. and uh, this this teacher happened. She was uh, she was Choctaw, and she said she looked at us and she said, uh, "Among the Choctaw, we don't trace our lineage through the father." You don't always know who the father is. But you always know who the mother is. So, in the same in the same sense, with uh, when you're trying to classify issues for support, you want to you want to do it based on what you see initially, rather than the internal you know the plumbing where where things are located in the library. Those things hold, they, they can be a secondary classification, but you always want to look at the first thing you, you see because that's what everybody can see. Um, uh, I already talked about the, uh, the, the, soft, the internal software. Um, when I talked, when I showed you that error screen before, uh, I mentioned the, 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 the that mail to uh, The problem on that screen is that we don't always know which library those those error message messages are coming from, and in a lot of cases, we're getting them, we're getting those messages from end users of Koha, so they don't know they don't even know to identify themselves as a particular library. They don't know who they're they're emailing in. Uh, they don't know who their email is from. So that would be something that, that I'd like to see is to make this more support. Um, data replication. Uh, I talked about grouping, uh, grouping, <coughs> grouping like things together. That's always going to make trouble. Um, it would be nice to be able to pull uh, data samples easily. To, you know, if we have a bug, click a button, get some JSON, attach that to the bug file. That would be neat. That would be just something quick that we can do. Uh, lowering the lowering the barriers on these things always makes finding bugs easier, which makes the rest of the code. You know, makes easier to code. makes Koha easier and better to support. Um, by 
defining of the initial state of data E. You know, it's, that's, that's important. Um, also being able to track and see what, what steps led up to a problem. Uh, that's not something that we, that's not something that's easy to do in Kamala. And sometimes it's easier than others. Um, and I do want to emphasize that there are trade-offs for these. You know, uh, how, you know, we don't want to give out too much uh, personally identifiable information on, on users for, for GDR, GDPR compliance issues. But at the same time, we need, we do kind of have to have an example. So these are these are things that we have to sort of think through a little bit. Um, so, but anyway, having the system logs the, the steps, the lead up to a problem, that that creates your test plan for you. Um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, troubleshooting, get rid of the scary basements. Um, make this make source code more, more legible. Um, and uh, I'd like to emphasize the use of, of Coha Log. So, uh, it's it's there. We don't use it enough, and that that is a a source of data that help us. So, um, technical support leads, uh, sort of lives under the constant threat of computers making more mistakes than we can handle. Our job is to help librarians and thereby help library patrons, and we want to do something so with kindness. And that is what that's what this is all about. So, I. A lot of this kind of, kind of comes across as a right, and it's not. It's this is a way to this is a way to make the whole better. Um, okay. um, quick postscript: I do have uh, I I, wrote, I put together a uh, Koha support plugin. Uh, that allows people to enter data into and, and mail it off to some email address. Uh, it's a work in progress uh, and may or may not be available on Friday morning in the access to talk about a little bit. Um, I'm leaving on Friday afternoon. Questions? Right. Thank you. I think there's a lot of great suggestions in there, and I think the members who contribute to the Koha code can sort of keep in mind while they're while they're improving Koha and be better as they think about. When you have a feature, what needs to be in there to help someone troubleshoot that feature if it goes wrong? Uh, I particularly like the comment about um, uh, a control vocabulary. As a system administrator who looks at a lot of cohort tables and tries to bless that timestamp column with a different name for every bloody table, uh, <laughs> I just agree to call timestamp and record the same field name and every table. That would help me a lot. Um, I was just going to add to that that we're all not just uh, supporters of Koha, but we're users of Koha. And some of you may do support, like uh, one of the presidents of Bywater do, some of you run your own support companies hosting Bywater. Uh, some of you may be doing the support within your own self hosted environment. Well, one of the things that I've always found that's helped me when I'm talking to tech support for some issue is. Think of the person that's trying to help you as your doctor. Doctor, I feel bad, doesn't give him any useful information, give her any useful information. So talk about your symptoms. What hurts? 
where does it hurt? Does it hurt when you do that? That type of thing. Uh, it's also kind of useful that at the same time, maybe think of it as reporting a crime to Sherlock Holmes. What happened? When did it happen? Where did it happen? And what steps led up to the event? And if you, if you think of it as more like talking to your doctor or talking to your policeman or talking to your detective, it sort of puts you in the mindset to provide the type of information that they need. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you very much, Thank you. All right, so uh, we're short on time. I want to make sure that everyone gets enough time to go to lunch and get some food. So can you ask Barton your question uh, when you get a chance directly? OK, thank you so much. Uh, all right, so we are going to.